14 days. And the doctor and the nurse are both struggling. Like, well, hi, everybody. Welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. I want to take a second and introduce our visiting artist this evening, Penelope Van Grinsman. Penelope uh, got her BA from University of Chicago and got her MFA in ceramics at the Pennsylvania State University. And um, she's currently living with an active studio practice in New Haven, Connecticut. And last semester, she was teaching at University of Colorado at Boulder. This semester, she's out in LA, which is why we were able to snag her into the Silver City. And she's um, a little bit later in the springtime here, she's gonna be doing a residency in Montana with Julia Galloway. So she's a busy lady bumping all over the place, and then we're lucky enough to have her stop here. So I'm gonna turn the microphone over to Penelope, and let's welcome her here to Silver City. Thanks so much, Courtney. It's really great to be here. I'm totally honored to be here at Western New Mexico University in Silver City. Um, yeah, I'm based in New Haven, but I, I have been bopping around a, a bit this year, and I'm grateful that it worked out, that I was so close to drive on over to you guys. Um, okay, so uh, just as way of introduction, I'm a potter, and a lot of the work that I'll be showing you today um, does revolve around ritual and performance. Those are two categories that I see my work um, speaking to. Uh, and also there's a, a curiosity that I have around <laughs> domestic interiors and um, the lives that objects witness within those domestic spaces. Um, so actually the first uh, series that I'll show you kind of relates to that, although I am throwing you guys a bit of a curveball, so bear with me. Um, all right, so this first series is called The Lawn Chairs. And uh, this work comes from um, the time right after undergrad. Uh, I went to school, as Courtney said, um, University of Chicago, and I moved from Chicago to Minneapolis. Um, and I moved to South Minneapolis to a sweet little neighborhood um, kind of the old suburbs of Minneapolis. Uh, and I was feeling like I was playing at being an adult for the first time, right? You know, right out of undergrad. And, um, I was taking note of the neighborhood that I had stepped into. And so one of the things that um, I was really struck by was summertime that I'd moved, and lots of my neighbors had these great collection of lawn chairs out in front of their houses. Um, and I felt pretty quickly like I could kind of assume who lived in the house based on their arrangement of lawn chairs outside. Um, so at, at this house, I might assume that it's a set of parents and three kids, maybe one's a little rowdy and has that lawn chair turned around. Um, at a house like this, uh, you know, a, a couple that like to stare out on their very lush garden on summer nights in Minneapolis. You can see in the background, there's another, there's another lawn chair there. Um, these guys, this very stately manor-like lawn that they have, um, just watching the neighborhood go by. Uh, and then I'd see something like this and think, you know, perhaps maybe it was a grandparent and, and two grandkids and sort of teaching them the way of living in Minneapolis and, and seeing what's happening outside. And something like this, I might start to consider maybe it's three roommates who really enjoy each other's company and, and like to all sit and talk at the end of an evening together. Uh, and then pretty soon I'd see something like this and, and start to think, man, this couple, I mean, they're just so self-absorbed that they would sit on the table and look at each other and just these proxy of lawn chairs for the people inside. Um, and then I'd see something like this and wonder, what? I cannot believe that these people would put this out in front of their crystal display that. Even this, I think this is actually in a backyard, but I could see from the street these lawn chairs ruling really up against each other. Pretty soon even the stacking, I was like, wow, the, the five people that live in there are so cozy. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, one like this. And, and finally, um, a set that just seems to spill into total debauchery there in front of me. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right, so that, that's gonna seem like a stretch, but I think I have a way of tying that back in later. That was my one tiny foray into photography, not even, just a moment in between undergrad and, and, and figuring out who I was in, as an artist. Um, but I guess going back a little bit to undergrad, uh, I want to share a little work from there. I, I've always enjoyed it in artist talks when they show some of the earliest stuff, especially as an undergrad, seeing that it was really nice to know where did they start and is there any 
reverberations of that later on in the work. So um, this is, this is going to pertain a little bit more to ceramics, although sculpture, I was a, um, a sculpture major as an undergrad. I uh, didn't do anything with pots until much later in Minneapolis. Um, and, and I was very concerned with the figure, and I had the sense that um, I, I felt like I could capture so much of an action just with the limbs. I was, I was really focused on, on just the arms and the legs. And um, so in, in this piece, this was called Kick Turn, and I, I really liked that moment at the end of, a, of swimming laps when you, you hit the end of the pool and then flip over and, and continue on. I wanted to try and capture that in a sculpture. So um, this is actually uh, a hydrocal cast. I would take um, plaster casts of actual limbs and then fill them sometimes with clay, sometimes with um, plaster, or, or in this case, hydrocal, and then some tile work below it. Um, this was called Splash Bomb. Uh, again, sort of aquatic focus thing. Um, I think I liked that tension of the, the full water underneath and then the um, punctured balloon in the hand up above, that moment maybe of release of a water balloon. Um, and then this one was shallow dive. Uh, just thinking about, again, that simple motion, the, the limbs diving in and the breaking against the water. Um, and it was, I got to the point where I was casting a lot of my friend's limbs and I don't exactly recommend doing this with plaster, but it, it always, no one was harmed in the process of making these sculptures. Um, but there was something missing in, in these for me. They, they felt very static and I, I don't know, I was after this motion and I just didn't really feel like I was capturing it. Um, but that was work from undergrad. And many years later, I actually, um, I saw a documentary about a choreographer named Pina Bausch. Um, the documentary is called Pina. Um, and Pina Bausch, a German choreographer, she passed away maybe in 2009 or so. Um, and uh, there was this wonderful movie about her work and it uh, featured quite a bit of um, performances by her troupe from Wuppertal um, in Germany. And, and this one, I just want to share one quick um, section from that. <laughs> Instructions that are on display. 
and people can take one of the, the spots and then they're given each of the steps for um, the choreography of this piece so that they can perform in it together. And I think I do have a video. from one vessel, um, maybe from this tall ewer or tall cylinder into the ewer, across into the bowl, and then back into the cylinder again. So the water is being recycled. Uh, when the next group steps up to do this performance, it's back in the um, first position, and then another group can engage in it. Uh, so here's um, the very first bit of instruction. It says, observe, there are four positions at the table. Please take an unoccupied position. Um, and then there are eight subsequent steps to uh, performing the actions of this piece. Um, and one thing that I, I really liked about this, so uh, all of the ceramic pieces are on this linen tablecloth, and you can see it, it leaves some remnants of, of pores that maybe spilled a little bit, or, or maybe the vessel itself wasn't so great at pouring, so a little bit of water actually came out. Um, and that meant that when other people then stepped up to the table, they could see that someone else had engaged in this before, but it's just water, so it did eventually evaporate. It wasn't you know, um, such a casualty for someone to actually spill a little bit of water, uh, but just a, a trace of past participants. Um, and, and the, the crucial moment in this whole piece um, was to make eye contact with everyone present at the table. That was the part that I was really excited about. I wanted everyone to slow down for just one second, and that um, direction came right before the pouring, because this was the one for me that I felt like, if everyone's pouring together, I'm gonna get these arches that I've been dreaming about having happen. Um, and I do kind of like looking at this image. It makes me think a little bit of those limbs, thinking about the, just the limbs containing the motion, although in this case I, I, I like to start thinking that actually they were always missing pots at the end of it. It's what I really wanted were the pots in motion. Um, and then in the background, I, you can barely see it, but um, I had this image in my studio. This is all staged in my studio. Um, and it's a photo of Georgia O'Keeffe. I got that from the O'Keeffe Museum, and she's pouring tea. And I didn't realize it until after I took the photo, but it felt like, oh, Georgia O'Keeffe is back there doing the performance with all of us. So. Um, yeah, some recurrence there. Okay, so um, another piece that revolves around another small gesture, um, this one, the act of cutting a flower, this was planting piece. Uh, and in this, um, I had set up a, a far more reduced set of instructions. The pouring piece, ultimately, I felt like, oh, there was so much language, and you know, people had to really be paying attention to know that they were doing things right, and I didn't want people to, to fret about getting things right in this. Um, so in this one, the instructions are really pared down. It's as simple as planting piece. Cut a flower, use a kneeling bench to plant it in a vase. Um, and so, just as I was say, you would step up to um, this uh, raised planter bed, and in it are daisies, and, and they're all in soil, so they were all live plants. And then you'd take a pair of scissors, cut the flower. Um, and, and just the act of cutting the flower, I was, I was starting to think like, wow, this gesture is, both so beautiful but so violent, right? It's the end of the life of a flower. Um, but I was uh, purposeful in choosing the daisies because I thought that they were a plant that you know, people would be more likely to feel comfortable to cut, to grab. There's that whole notion of um, pulling the petals off of daisies, he loves them, he loves them not, kind of thing. Um, so the daisy, the daisy really worked for me for this piece. But then you cut it and then take it over to one of these kneeling benches and then plant it in one of the bud bases. Um, another thing that I, I was really after is getting people to handle pots in a gallery, in a museum space where, where normally they'd be off limits. And I completely understand why pots are usually off limits. They are so fragile and you just wouldn't want things to break. Um, but it is always a sadness when you see something and you really just want to touch it and, and know what this pot's about. Because there's, there's information that you can only glean when you're uh, handling it. So uh, I was really excited. I, I had these little tiny bud vases and they were all um, flipped over upside down to ensure that you couldn't just like stick the stem of the flower in and never actually handle the clay, right? You had to actually flip it over and then um, 
put the flower inside. So that's what's happening here. Um, there was no instruction on what to reflect on in this action, but I did get a lot of people who would come up to me after and say, wow, in this moment, you know, I was thinking about someone from my life, or, uh, you know, I felt like this was a, a meditative and reflective moment for me, this um, action of planting, so. Uh, and I, I did also appreciate that, um, once again, kind of like the spilling of water in that pouring piece, uh, that you could see the remnants of past participants, right? You would know that people had done this before because some of the vases would be filled and some of them wouldn't. Um, there were even sort of patterns that could emerge in. Uh, more often than not, the, the bud vases that were at the very farthest spot would fill the last, right? It'd be at the farthest reach to get to. Um, and over time, uh, some flowers would start to wilt and then the ones that had been more recently cut would be fresh. And I liked that um, bit of time that occurred in this piece that was marked. All right, uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit more about an, another work um, that revolves around my frustration about not being able to touch things in the gallery. And this one, it's kind of hard to show in images, so <laughs> do bear with me, but um, it's called uh, Hans Koper in a Box. And um, Hans Koper was a, a British potter, um, really active uh, in the mid-century, um, and uh, yeah, he made fantastic forms. And, his pots are in lots of museums' collections. Um, they are functional wares, um, for the most part. There are some larger sculptural pieces, but always referencing a vessel. But they're in museums' collections, and um, it'd be very hard to get your hands on one unless you have a lot of money to spend to, to do that. Um, or knew someone with a private collection on the Hans Koper maybe. Uh, but okay, so in this box, you can see um, the fellow who's, who's interacting with the piece. He's got his hands going in the box, and there's a, a set of headphones that he's got on. And so inside the box itself is a replica of a Hans Koper pot. And the way that I was able to do that, um, this was done while I was at Penn State, and in the um, Campus Museum collection, they did have a Hans Koper pot. So I was able to contact the registrar, and I was never actually able to handle this pot, but she was able to take it out uh, from the case, and then I took hundreds of images of it, photos of it in the round, and then I, I sent all of those images through this software called Stitcher, and it was able to um, give back to me a 3D replication of it. Then I took that 3D replication from my computer, and um, through a CNC, computer numeric control device, was able to mill out and plaster a mold of the pot, then pour slip into it, and then get out my own replica. So I never actually touched the pot until the very end when it came, oops, when it came out of, um, of the mold. That's my slip cast mold. And you can see, I mean, um, I think in this next image is even more clear. Mine is obviously a, a, a proxy for this. It's, it's, um, it's missing a lot of the <laughs> crucial detail, the things that really make the Hans Gover maybe the most exciting. Um, but for this, this desire that I had to actually be able to touch the thing, and it is, um, it's the exact right proportion and the, the, general, the general contours of the form are there for sure. Um, so then I, I put this pot back in the box. Yeah, okay, back in the box, and you'd stick your hands in. And there was this other component, the audio component, right? So I'm, I'm gonna play a little bit of the audio for you, um, and if you just imagine yourself maybe touching the pot, because it's not the full experience without touching it, but. But the other thing, of course, was that you put these pots on a stand. Yeah. So that it was like incorporating the plinth into the actual pot itself. Because um, when you look at it first, you think it might be a cup sitting on a Neck, and it's not. And, it, and it, what it does is to give the pot an extraordinary sense of formality. It roots it on the ground. It's the plinth. It's the object on the plinth. So the object and the plinth are one and the same. A plinth, of course, we think of a plinth as performing a function. It isolates an object. It um, presents an object. It puts it into space. Uh, but it gives it an object. But it gives that object out of its space. If it had been in various people's homes, it would have had flowers in it, probably, wouldn't it? I mean, Lucy would have put flowers in his pot. Um, I mean, I can see why you wouldn't want to have a kind of thing. I can, you know, one can see them in a certain sort of material. 
Okay, I'll stop up there. There's six minutes of audio. And so all of that um, comes from uh, four or five um, art historians and uh, ceramics critics and a couple of makers. Um, they're all British, you can probably hear that. Uh, and this was all um, audio posted on the Victoria and Albert website where they're actually looking at another one of these spade pots. This was a form that he made many, many of. So they're looking at a, a very similar one um, and then reflecting on the form. Um, and I thought it was so funny because there, there's such a range. Some of them are you know, very impressed with the form or, or they love it, but then others actually seem to not be so impressed or um, playing it down. Um, but I, I wanted to include that extra bit of information to someone feeling it because you were robbed of sight, right? When your hands were in the box, you couldn't actually see anything anymore. Um, but to have them talk you through the form, I thought could add another element um, to it. Uh, so um, I think the, the most fruitful time that this piece was displayed was back at Penn State at that campus museum. Um, there was a group of visually impaired visitors that came in for a special night and they had gotten out a few things from the collection that they could touch um, or things that not all of these visitors were um, you know, completely blind. They did have some vision left maybe and so there were some things in the collection that maybe were brighter or, or could you know, be more readily viewed. Um, but the curator asked me to bring this piece back. So I was able to put it back in front of the case with the Hans Koper in it and then have these visitors handle it. Um, and it was amazing to hear the reactions to it. Like, um, one of the most striking things was that they, they actually stuck through it. They had listened to all six minutes of the audio, which I think everyone else who interacted with it, it was like 10 or 15 seconds, and then this is kind of weird, uh, you know, I don't know what's going on, and then they'd move on. But these guys, they stuck with it, and, uh, and then they would talk to me about the form inside and things that they had noticed about it, and it was just um, really great to hear how they maybe already are existing in a world where they're, they're using so much of their tactile sense to understand things, and, and here was a situation where it was um, set up for them to do, and, and there was lots that I could learn from that. So, um, Hans Koper. All right, so, um, this is a, a project that I, I did on residency in Sweden, um, and it all revolves around a ceramic form that I'm so captivated by. Um, it's the Korean moon jar, it's there in the bottom right corner, this is one example of it. Um, the, the Korean moon jars that I was looking at were coming from the Chosun dynasty, um, and uh, uh, yeah, there aren't very many of them remaining. I think there's only 20 in the world or so uh, of these moon jars. Um, one thing that's, that's so captivating about them, the way that they're made, they're actually thrown into two parts. It's, it's two very large bowls, very large open bowls, and then one is flipped over on top of the other, and then they do get in and address the seam a little bit, but uh, one of the most beautiful things that happens, especially in these you know, fantastic moon jars, is that the seam reveals itself again in the firing. Um, uh, yeah, it may have been even more um, fully sealed when it was thrown, but then in the firing there's a little bit of that um, hinging that happens again. Uh, they're made with porcelain, uh, which would have just been a, a you know, local regional clay, in Korea and um, glazed with this milky white glaze. And uh, there's some conflicting things on, at least in the research that I've done about what they were used for. Um, some people will say for storing wine or water, but there's no lid to these moon jars and it just doesn't seem like the best use of something. They'd be hard to pour out of. Um, I've also heard for planters, uh, but actually most recently I was talking to someone who told me that um, they were often stored in um, men's offices who were intellectuals and, and wanted to sort of signal their Confucian intellectualism. And so these um, you know, beautiful, mysterious forms would be somewhere in the office. And then only in the late spring, maybe a couple of sprigs of cherry blossoms would be displayed inside the moon jars. Um, but I, I like that mystery that surrounded them, their use. And, um, and I, I was so curious about that. So going on this uh, residency in Sweden. I was there during the time of the midnight sun, and I, I kind of wanted to come up with yet another function for a moon jar-like object. Um, so I proposed this project, uh, and, and what it was was that people would borrow a moon jar and then take a photo of it at midnight, and because it was the time of the midnight sun, um, the moon, maybe you could see it in the sky, but it, it certainly wasn't shining light um, in the way that it would at other times of the year. 
And so the moon was sort of missing, and maybe this moon jar could take the place of that. Um, so I, I made 20 moon jars while I was there, and the exchange was that people would give me back a photograph um, of the moon jar in their house. And I, I had no control over how they set it up. I didn't want to know where or how, um, just to get that, or like how they were taking the photograph, just to get this image back to see. Um, and, and this was kind of a sneaky way for me. I, I was coming an American. I only knew a couple of people there, but I, I wanted to meet people kind of quickly in the, the two and a half months that I was there. Um, so this ensured that I, I had to make some friendships, at least enough to get people to agree to do this project with me. Uh, and I was um, taking a little tram all around with these moon jars, which mine were a little bit smaller maybe than the traditional Korean ones, but still, um, you know, a good 16 inches by 16 inches. I think the, the larger ones are, are probably more like 20, 24, maybe tops by 24. But, so mine were maybe two thirds the size, but I was still walking around with a big canvas bag in Sweden, dropping off these moon jars and then showing up again maybe a week later to pick the moon jar back up again and get these photos back from them at some point in return. Um, so these are some of the images that uh, people gave back. Um, sometimes they incorporated themselves into the, the image, which I, I really love. This is the one that's on that flyer for the talk, but um, I was excited when this one came back. I would never have thought of taking a, a photo quite like this um, to cast a shadow like that. Uh, this moon jar um, came back from a woman, Elizabeth, an Australian, a, a writer, and she actually composed um, a little short story about sleeping next to the moon jar and then having this dream where she slid inside the moon jar and, and slept there and um, it was really nice uh, and actually in, in looking back on these photos I can't help but think about the people right I made these connections and, and um, I'm so grateful to have that uh, to know those details um, yeah this woman slept next to the moon jar insisted on it being a very grainy photo that was something that I remember going back and forth with her and she's like no it absolutely needs to be grainy and I was like you're right I asked you for this. I wanted your photo, not the photo that I would take. So, um, another woman sleeping with it. It was, it was surprising because there was no prompt about um, actually being present in the photo. I just said to take a photo of the moon jar, but sometimes people included themselves in it. Uh, but there's narrative in this piece for sure. Um, yeah, a couple of people took them up to their, their studios, their summer cabin. Um, and this is one that came back from there. And so then when I, I got all the moon jars back um, at the end of my residency and I, I had a, a little exit show with them, all the moon jars were present and then the photos were um, displayed too. And then uh, in, in this residency space was like space to work and also space to live. So there, there was a bedroom and um, I projected the photos that I got in exchange onto the wall with one of the smaller moon jars there just to kind of hint again at, at what had happened in this, in this performance. Um, because display is, is something that I, I, I still feel like with each piece, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what the best solution um, for displaying the work may be, and, and this felt like it was getting a little bit closer to that. Okay, so uh, back in New Haven, um, this is a, a recent project that I've been working on. Um, there's a, a food justice organization in town called City Seed, and um, they support immigrants who uh, have a background in cooking. Um, this organization, City Seed, uh, will um, help provide catering services. So if, if any of the cooks or chefs want to, to work with that, there's dinners that they host and there's um, two new restaurants that they started in town um, with the immigrant cooks. And so as a potter, I was just moving to town and I was like, I wanna get involved with these guys, food and play, it seems so appropriate. And um, so I, I approached them and they paired me with this woman, Mona, the woman in the pink. Um, She's from Syria, from Damascus, and uh, and they said, yeah, you know, go ahead and work on a project together. So um, when I when I first approached her, I had this idea that I was like, I'm a potter, and I, I like trying to remake forms and maybe historical forms sometimes. Um, you know, I would love to try to make some of the pots that maybe you left behind at home. So she didn't take everything with her in moving from Syria, and so I thought there's probably things that you've left there that maybe I could help to remake. And um, we had a couple of sessions together and sketched out some ideas, and then eventually, uh, through her translator, uh, Karina, the woman um, uh, in the blue on my right, um, Mona was like, you know what, that's a fine idea, but I actually want to make new stuff. And she was like, um, 
I like New Haven. New Haven is a nice city. And uh, I, she was saying that she wasn't having a hard time necessarily finding the produce or the spices that were from home, but she still felt this enormous sense of loss and longing from all the people that she had left in this place that you know has changed so dramatically. Um, but, but she wanted to reflect on that in a different way. Um, and I was really glad that she did say that, but I didn't just like force her to do something that I was inspired to do. But um, we came up with this other project where she picked out a couple of simple plate forms in my studio, and so I made a bunch of these, and then she inscribed some text on them, and, and her Arabic is so beautiful. Um, but all the text that she inscribed uh, had made references to um, loss and longing. It was uh, some poetry and some lyrics from songs that she was using on those, and uh, so I think we, made, we ended up making just around 60 plates, plates that she could serve some of the meals on, um, uh, that people would actually eat off of, individuals would eat off of, but then she also used some of them to serve some of the smaller dishes. So I, I just have a, an overhead shot of that in use. And her food is so beautiful. When I saw the food on it, I was like, oh my god, the plates are not, yeah, compared to this. Um, but yes, this is a project that uh, we've, we've just started, and I'm, I'm really excited to pick it back up again and, and see it through a couple of iterations. Um, because, yeah, I'm getting a lot out of it, for sure. Okay, so um, uh, one last piece that sort of speaks to ritual and performance and community, maybe. It's a preview of something that I'm doing um, next month at the um, annual ceramics conference in SICA. It's taking place in Minneapolis this year. And um, I'm going to be in the project space, which is at this conference, there's one major um, resource hall where all of the vendors are, are selling um, tools and, and uh, wheels and then there's galleries that will have pots on display um, but then there's also space for some projects that are going on um, uh, usually like um, time durational kinds of projects anyway I am setting up this um, pop-up demolition site and I just have one audio component so very short So that was the smash of a pot. <laughs> and I'm hoping to hear this sound over and over again. Uh, so what I'm asking for is for people that are attending the conference to bring a failure to the conference, right? As ceramicists, we all experience a lot of failure. And oftentimes I think it's something that we deal with alone, right? You, I mean, everyone knows it's happening and you might like tell someone like, oh, I unloaded this kiln and you know, half of the things didn't work out or whatever. But then what we do with the failures is usually just this solo thing, like at the dumpster or at the trash can at home or whatever. Um, maybe you take the shards out to the yard for some planting or something like that. Um, but here, I want us to do it together. Because I feel like it's, we're so resilient working with clay, right? You, you have to be to continue to work with clay. So I'm asking people to bring a piece to smash. Um, and so they'll hopefully ascend a flight of stairs like this, throw their, their pot or ceramic sculpture in, um, the whole project is called reprocessing because I will be a, a laborer in this little demolition site and um, I'll be taking the shards and further processing them down to put into postcards. Postcards that will be a little memento that people can either send out or, or save, I guess, um, and a reflection of this experience that they've had. Um, the postcards, uh, I, I got the idea from um, like the Berlin Wall postcards, I'm, I'm sure some of you guys have seen this, where it'll just be like a, a tiny little bit of the Berlin Wall, supposedly, with some spray paint on it. Um, although I have heard that if you took all of the scraps of the Berlin Wall, you'd have like three or four times the length of the Berlin Wall, so it could not possibly be it. But um, anyway, uh, kind of in that, in that vein, um, a little shard from this conference experience. Um, and yeah, you could send it out. Maybe to a friend, Clady Potter, if you're so lucky to have <laughs> a friend named that. Um, yeah. All right. So that's that's it, you guys. I'm, I'm happy to take questions, and I, I do want to thank you again for having me here. It's, it's been really great.
borrow a moon jar, moon jar and take a photo of it. I didn't want it to be like a purchase a moon jar and then also give me a photo. I, I wanted that to be free of the um, money exchange. So I, I, took the, I took the moon jars back and then I, I had this exhibition in, in my residency space and then sold the moon jars at the exhibition. So people did, did buy them um, at the end of that time. There were a couple that were left over and because I was flying back and I couldn't take them with me, I ended up in, in this residency space, there was like a, almost like a cemetery of old work. So there, there are a couple of moon jars that are back in the forest behind the residency, but otherwise the rest of them did go to people. And some, some, of, them, some of the people that borrowed moon jars did end up buying a moon jar and they wanted the moon jar that they had been with. It was kind of funny that they were like, that one is mine. Um, but then other people uh, came into the show. And, I know mine didn't have that really nice scene line to merge. Oh, yeah. I, there's still so much to learn from this form, and, and one that I want to return to over and over. It's, it's, yeah, I mean, I think your eye gets sharper as you do it, and um, yeah, I do I do wish that I had more of a scene line in mine. I definitely was trying to put, you know, but yes. <laughs> nervous when I'm putting these things together like is anyone gonna even agree to do this and it's kind of weird to, to feel like I can take that power and say like I'm creating this new ritual that I want you to engage in and so far I, I have been pleasantly surprised that people haven't been too resident or maybe they maybe those people just haven't you know um, agreed to participate but yeah yeah so far um, pretty good reaction and, and I think sometimes I have had people reflect on like oh this reminds me maybe especially like in that planting piece like the kneeling bench might feel like uh, something that you'd see at a Catholic church or something like that, a, a kneeling thing. Um, and I'm sure that that was there in the back of my mind. It, it certainly wasn't exactly what I meant for it to be, but I don't mind that there is some overlap there. Um, and I do appreciate when people tell me like, this yeah, makes me think of something else, so yeah. 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 Yeah, I like that. I, in all honesty, for me, I, I don't know if I said this or not, but it, it was this like reversal in, in specifically in that planting piece where I was thinking how normally you take a flower from the ground, you kneel to the ground in your backyard to cut it, right? And then you take it indoors and put it up above in a vase. And I was like, this time I want to take and cut from above and then kneel down into the vase. And, and what does reversing that action do to change it? Yeah, but it did have that effect of kneeling. To, I mean, there is, yeah an action of humility or something that happens. Yeah, and yeah, just to kneel down. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, those viewers. Um, oh, so I guess maybe I wasn't referencing. I think in the form, there's certainly some influence. Um, yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's interesting. Maybe that's the one that makes the most sense to be porcelain, just because historically they were made in porcelain. Um, yeah, I think with the others, I mean, it, it is a material that just personally I have a preference for it. Um, it's not that I've never worked in any other clay body, but I do like it. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm sure that there will be projects that arise in the future where it's not right, but. <laughs> yeah. I'm intrigued by the fact that in all of 
is there is some instruction mm -hmm. on what one does. Mm -hmm. But there's quite a bit of freedom. Mm -hmm. And I can see that if you're trying to do this ritual, you, you would have instructions. In mm -hmm. fact, most rituals would have <coughs> 10 times the amount of instructions. Yeah. Are you thinking of doing things that have almost no instruction? Yeah. Yeah, I would like to. It, it, I think text is one of the things that maybe I get the most pushback from. Um, I think oftentimes people are just confronted by even a small amount of text and there's an immediate reaction to like not want to engage with it. Uh, so yeah, I think um, considering pieces that uh, are more self-explanatory um, would be great. Yeah. There's a small amount of text. Yeah. Can yeah. you talk about your relationship to the gallery and the museum and how like uh, have you done any of these pieces out in public spaces outside of the art world? And if so, how? What was your response like yeah. for people? Yeah, I think the only variation that I, I've gotten so far is like maybe the residency project where it was I, I was like handing out brochures to right. people that I met at the grocery store or um, at some artist spaces, the places that I thought, especially like the art community spaces that I thought people would be a little bit more inclined to participate. So that felt like getting it out on the ground a little bit more. Um, and I am excited about this conference piece because it is not, it's not in a gallery or in a museum, um, but it is still in like a, you know, art institutionally minded space because it is a, a ceramics conference. Um, yeah, I would like to do more out. I, I think maybe in, in, um, in that last piece with um, City Seat, that felt like getting it out of the gallery too. Um, you know, the, the meals that they host, um, that Mona, the, the cook that I've been working with hosts, are at people's houses uh, for the most part. So it, it is getting that out of the space, but yeah. Yeah, I think the museum can be great, but it can also be problematic, right? There's only a certain crowd of people that go through the space, and yeah, to get other people, other folks in front of it, I think is a push, yeah, yeah. I think a lot of the power of this comes from your explicitly not saying how to think, how to feel about it, and um, yeah, I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that, because that's something that I, I have been thinking about. Um, how, how lovely those gestures are, and how nice it is to participate in some of those gestures. Like, I, I always like when I'm, when I'm um, included in something that, that maybe is simple to reenact, um, but you can do together. I think that that's really nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, fun. It's interesting to see that a lot of these, with the exception of the, the moon spots, were done in galleries. And having done so, if you have just placed everything in there without the text, yeah. people are still, I would think, hands off. It's a gallery. Yeah. I'm here to look. Yeah. And nothing would happen. Yeah. So the fact that that you encourage them then to become the happening uh, is something that we typically don't find in a gallery setting. Whereas the pieces that are for the home, mm -hmm. the ritual of eating becomes mm -hmm. a natural. Yeah. And people know what to do with it. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, I think it's even hard, even when the instructions say, please touch or please engage with the thing, it's still hard to get people in a museum in a gallery setting to do that, but yeah, it, it's funny because I think the point that you're making that once it's in the house, there's just no question of, of how to handle, how to, yeah, how to operate now. And it's interesting too that, you know, are the people who are bringing the pieces to Antica mm -hmm. going to be the ones who trash them? Yes, yeah, absolutely, definitely. And uh, having <laughs> had a group of uh, basketball kids that I coached, and at the end of the season, we've got all these pots, and I would you just crash them into the, in the garbage can. Yeah. And the first time they would just take it and delicately throw it in, it wouldn't break. And I said, no, that's not the point. If you keep doing that, we're not going to have enough room <coughs> in the trash can. Go ahead and smash it. Yeah. And the idea was letting everything go, smash, and these girls turned around and went, wow. Wow. I've 
together that allowed to do that. And they really felt good. It's almost like the reflection on Jackson College Canyon. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I'm kind of hoping to maybe get a, a, a live feed going from within the pits so you could see some of these things falling in. And it would be curious to know, like, yeah, how they're thrown in and, and yeah, how likely they are to break. Um, yeah. That's great. Yeah. Um, with the pot that you really wanted to touch, um, you replicated it, why did you put it in a box instead of, like, setting it out and letting people, like, really, like, examine it? Yeah. So I, I did want to take away, I thought, you know what, here's a pot, this Hans Koper stayed form that you can see, you see kind of frequently, if you're looking for them, if you're someone who's into Hans Koper, there are lots of museums that have his work um, in their collection, so you can see it a lot, but I was like, you never get to touch it. So I'm going to take it and I'm going to take away your sight this time and only give you the touch. Um, but I will say, uh, when this has been installed, and, and most recently it was up at um, Carbondale Clay in, in Colorado. I saw images where people um, are actually, they're like down and looking through the holes and maybe just one hand is in and I'm like, oh, no, no, that's not the point. But, you know, at that point it's like they get to do whatever they want with it. So I think people still really do want to see the pot too inside. Um, and it, yeah, it's hard to take that away entirely. So, yeah. yeah. So since you did it a second time, did you have any Oh, when I took it back to the museum that one night, it was just one night only back at the campus museum. And yeah. How that it seemed to be well, so then in that case, it was it was a group of visually impaired visitors. So I mean, I think maybe they could, they could. It's not that they couldn't see it, but it maybe was just you know fuzzier or hazier for many of them. I mean, some of them probably wouldn't have been able to. But behind the glass, yeah, it would have been harder. I think. Oh yeah. I liked that. I did like that. And I did I did take a couple of photos of that for sure. It also felt a little like sacrilege because you know, here's my like weird copy and I'm getting it. I you know, I was like still so aware of like how far away it was from the actual Hans Koper and I was like, oh. you know, I don't know. The sense of like, would the artist approve of this? Uh, who knows? But okay, we're going for it. So yeah. Any <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I hope. Yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you guys. Oh, yeah. Did all your moon jars survive? Uh, like survive the firings? No, survive like as you said you were traveling with them to go yeah. give them to people oh, and then they traveled yes, back. Oh, yes, they did. Yeah, actually, there were no casualties on the way. I did. I had these like really large canvas bags that I um, had ordered uh, while I was there because I was thinking about how am I going to trans. I didn't have a car obviously while I was there, and I. I was already asking for lots of favors from people, so like to drive around, me to drive me around with these moon jars. Yeah, so I, I did shoulder them, and I would take maybe at the max two at a time, one on either side, um, and just a little trail. Yeah, but they all made it. Anybody else have questions? Thank you so much.